My name's Kelly Smart and I am the Lead Admiral Nurse at Tameside and Glossop Integrated Care Foundation Trust. I'm here to speak to you today about the legal and financial aspects of accessing care for people with dementia and their carers. So I'm going to start by discussing the Mental Capacity Act, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. The whole point of this act is to protect those who are unable to make decisions themselves, but also to empower those that can. As professionals, we should always assume everyone has capacity unless we have reason to believe otherwise. In which case, a capacity assessment would be required. I regularly encounter professionals who've skipped this part and jumped straight to organising a best interest meeting on the assumption that because this person has dementia, they lack capacity. So just to reiterate, just because someone has dementia does not mean they cannot make decisions themselves. It's important we do everything in our power to help that person to make that decision themselves. If we recognise that they are better at certain times of the day, can we address it at that time of the day? If they need somebody to explain things in to them so that they can understand, explain them in a different way. Do they need an interpreter? Do they need someone familiar with them to help them to put the situation into context? Remember that any capacity assessment anyone does it's not only time specific, but it's also decision specific. Just because someone isn't able to make a decision about one aspect of their life doesn't mean they're not able to make a decision about any aspect of their life. We should always start from this point. Considering capacity is what allows people the freedom and the space to make the decisions properly themselves. If we've explored every option possible and this person is still struggling to make a decision through lack of capacity, then we have to move on and we have to we have to arrange a best interest meeting. So when organising a best interest meeting, it's important that you include people who know the person as well as professionals. I regularly receive invites to best interest meetings and on the face of it, I can see why I'm classed as a specialist dementia nurse working in a hospital. Someone may be coming in for a procedure that I know nothing about. I don't know many surgical operations or interventions. Um, I won't know anything about that. And I also might not know the person. So they're relying on the fact that because I have knowledge of dementia, I can assist in this process. The reality is I can't. If I don't know the person and I have no knowledge of their circumstances, their quality of life, I also have no knowledge of the procedure they're about to undertake. What value am I going to add to that meeting? None. I, reg I regularly decline these meetings, um, much to people's disgust, but it's important that people understand the significance of this meeting. The whole point is to make the best decision for that person. It's important that you explore whether someone's got an advanced care plan, an advanced decision to refuse treatment, a lasting power of attorney or deputyship. If someone has a document which contains their wishes at a time when they were able to express those wishes or a loved one, is familiar with their wishes or what they would have wanted given the current circumstances. It's important that professionals endeavour to meet those requests as best they can. It's not always possible, it's not always safe, but sometimes professionals are making decisions completely away from what's written within those documents, which is wrong. We should always provide the least restrictive option most of most times that's at home with a care package, depending on the situation and again, the safety aspects of that decision. If someone has lasting power of attorney for property and finance, they can act as attorney from the outset. As soon as that document has been registered and is sent back to the individuals concerned, 
that can be used straight away. So someone can start to manage someone's financial affairs and their property. The lasting power of attorney for health and welfare is different. You can only act as a capacity of an attorney once that person has lost capacity. So you cannot step in as power of attorney for health and welfare and make decisions about someone who still has the capacity to do that themselves. We find this very often, well, I've got power of attorney. And as important as that is, we need to make carers understand. And, and I do feel we perhaps should be pointing that out from the outset. Um, I don't feel it's clear. I think there's a lot of carers that truly believe that they have the right to make decisions on their loved one's behalf because they are listed as power of attorney for health and welfare. Once that person has lost capacity to make decisions, any decisions, then at that point, this would have to be enacted with the Court of Protection and then it would it would be able to be used. In encounters with someone who's been diagnosed with dementia but remains able to make decisions themselves, it's prudent that we advise them about the use of all of these documents. An advanced decision to refuse treatment isn't necessarily relevant for everybody, but if you meet with somebody and they have very strong wishes about what they do not want to happen in the future, they do not want to receive this treatment or that treatment or this surgery, then an advanced decision to refuse treatment is the document. An advanced care plan is broader than that. You can talk about things like where they would want to end their days, where they would want to be, who they would want to be with. Often when writing advanced care plans, we do get the wishes of, I don't want to go in a care home. And whilst that may well be their wish, it's something that I don't ever advise carers to agree to, to make promises about. This is the biggest source of guilt among carers who've promised a loved one they will not put them, place them into a 24 hour care situation. Nobody knows what the future holds. Nobody knows if they're going to be well enough, if their personal circumstances or financial circumstances are going to allow them to stay at home and care for their loved one for the duration of their illness. Sometimes people can't keep the loved one safe. Sometimes there are reasons why people will go into 24 hour care. So when writing an advanced care plan, I do discuss this and I do try my utmost to ensure that this is understood when writing the document to, to if nothing else, to alleviate the guilt of the carer. Lasting power of attorney for property and finance and lasting power of attorney for health and welfare um, allow the person to make decisions on behalf of the person with dementia property and finance from the beginning, health and welfare from the point that that person has lost capacity. Deputyship is slightly different and is applied for after the person has lost capacity. Um, it's not as easy, it's not as straightforward because the person with dementia is not agreeing to that as they are not able to agree. So it is left to someone else to decide the appropriateness of that deputyship. And obviously, a last will and testament is particularly helpful when somebody passes away. Family members will crawl out of the woodwork with all sorts of stories and all sorts of anger and emotional issues as soon as somebody dies. A last will and testament will clear that up without as much drama as there would be without it. So from experience, I know that many people with dementia will access care at some point throughout their journey. I think there's more that, that do than those that don't. Um, the very first thought that is mentioned, sorry, the very first, first thought that the carer or the patient living with dementia will have is, how much is this going to cost? How am I going to fund this? But so many professionals don't discuss the elephant in the room until very late down, down the line, which leads to many sleepless nights, a lot of upset, a lot of anger, a lot of resentment, a lot of rejection. No, we don't want care. We don't need care. It leads to dishonesty from the carer or from the person with dementia because they don't understand what's at stake and they'd rather not risk it. 
There's definitely no one size fits all approach to this, but generally speaking, you can reassure them in some ways. So please, where possible, consider this. Sometimes we know straight away that people will be self-funding due to the sheer volume of their equity. But despite this, they are, these people are still entitled to a social care assessment. It can be very difficult to get this assessment for self-funding people. So it's important as professionals that we advocate for them and we empower them of their rights. A social assessment helps people to access the correct care first time, regardless of how it's funded. So let me drill down a bit further into this. Residential care homes. These are whole care homes without a nurse. These homes are chargeable. It is the responsibility of the local authority to recover the costs of these charges and it is means tested. So it basically means the cost depends on how much money the person has. Now remember, if only one person needs care, they only take into account that one person's money and assets or 50% of joint assets if, if they're a married couple. So if someone is assessed as needing nursing care rather than residential care, the this is the cost of residential care plus the cost of nursing care. So the NHS fund the nursing care element, which is on top of the residential care costs. So currently this is £187.60 per week towards the cost of care. So it would only be the residential part of the care the cost that would need to be paid. Anyone requiring care, whether that's a care package at home or in a 24 hour care environment, if they're in receipt of attendance allowance, this will automatically be redirected towards the cost of care. Therefore, this will come off the balance each month. So how do people receive local authority funded care? They have to have less than £23,250 in capital. Capital includes home, land, bank accounts, shares and premium bonds. If that person has less than £14,250 in total, they will be exempt from payment. If they have between £14,250 and £23,250, they will have to pay a contribution to the cost, but not the full cost. This is £1 per week for every £250 of capital towards the cost of care. So if somebody had £500 capital, they would pay £2 per week. If you are below the threshold of £14,250, nothing will be taken from the capital, but you may need to contribute from any other income that you receive and the local authority will pay the difference. CHC funding is a topic in itself. It could take all afternoon and we'd still have so much to discuss. I'll touch on it briefly because it's important. So it is available for those with a primary health care need. It's a very contentious issue among carers. There are forums on Facebook, there are, there are forums on the internet where carers will meet and talk and moan and discuss the professionals that have purposely not allowed them to receive that funding. Of course, that's not the real situation. The reality is that carers believe because someone has dementia and they're finding it difficult to care for that person, they believe that they should be awarded that. The reality is that only if their health needs are bigger than their social needs, will they receive that and significant enough for that to take over their social needs. So just be aware that when dealing with CHC, there is a lot of preconceived ideas from carers and it does cause confrontation very, very regularly when people are turned down. As an Admiral nurse, we are in um, a better position than the person doing the assessment. 
from my perspective, we are there to provide an advocacy service for that the carer or the person with dementia. I spend some time before CHC assessments preparing them for what's what's to come, preparing them for what type of questions they will be asked and helping them to consider what type of evidence they may be able to bring to the table during this assessment. Sometimes even I will struggle to get through to the carer that it's not necessarily as as bad, as difficult as they feel. The difficulty comes with the CHC process in that the categories are the worst one is severe. Um, many carers feel like their loved one, their symptoms of their loved one are severe. Um, that's not how it works and that's the difficulty. The terminology does not lend itself to a layperson's in involvement in the assessment and it's important that they are involved in the assessment. So let's move on from CHC. Let's ask the question, will they take my home? This is everyone's worst fear. It's the question that the carer will always ask when you start to talk about the cost of care. So these are generally speaking the rules. The person requiring care, their home will only be disregarded in the following circumstances. The person is receiving care in their own home, i.e. a care package. They are in temporary respite care in a care home and intend to return to the home at some point, or they are in a care home awaiting the sale of this property to buy something more suitable for their needs. Also, if the home is occupied by the following people, a partner, a former partner, a civil partner, all of these unless they are estranged, a lone parent who is the person's estranged or divorced partner, the link being the child, a qualifying relative over the age of 60, an incapacitated adult or their child who is under the age of 18. In all other circumstances, the home will be considered and taken into account. So what if they don't qualify? So these are the circumstances in which the local authority will offer a deferred payment agreement. So if the person's needs are going to be met in a care home, if they have a legal or beneficial interest in a property that is their main or only home. If their home is not disregarded when assessing how much capital they have. If they have less than £23,250 in capital assets, excluding the value of the home. The local authority can obtain adequate security for the payment and interest or, or administration costs by the way of a legal charge on the property. Genuine and informed written consent can be obtained from all those with an interest in the property being offered as security and all parties agree to all the terms and conditions of the agreement. So that puts it on the table that basically the people who qualify can, can straight away alleviate the property. The people who don't qualify can offer a deferred payment, i.e. they can put a charge on your property so that when it is sold, the costs that are owing will be paid at that time. So I've talked about a number of different topics and it's difficult to summarise, but a lot of this is about humility. Remember that there is a person or people at the centre of this situation. Most people in normal circumstances do worry about money. Currently, in the current climate, everyone is worried about money. Don't make assumptions that people understand how things work. Our systems and processes and local authority systems and processes are not straightforward by any means. Even professionals get confused. Don't leave them guessing or worrying. We have had instances of suicide where carers have been so worried about what's going to happen next that they have taken their life. We've got carers that are already really working hard 
for no for no pay or little pay who then feel under pressure financially because they don't know the answers to questions they're not going to sleep they're not going to eat it's going to add to their stress it's not going to make the situation any better show some humility don't create yet another barrier in an already complex system the point of admiral nursing in an, an acute trust is definitely to ensure that systems and processes are understood by carers and people with dementia. We do make it difficult. The systems and processes are set up for professionals use, not lay people. We make things complicated. We over assess people. We have numerous assessments going on at numerous times. We follow numerous policies, none of which we explain to carers or patients with dementia. And this makes it really difficult. My role as an admiral nurse in an acute trust, I spend a lot of time exploring this with carers and making sure they understand why things are taking so long, what the delays are, what the barriers are, what needs to happen next, and what the process says from start to finish. Many family circumstances are different and complex. So as I said earlier, there is never a one size fits all approach. If anything complex is highlighted to you, rather than trying to wing it, I advise them to speak to a solicitor to seek legal advice. Every situation is different and it's important that they get the right information. We don't want them to, even with the best intentions, you don't want to mislead them and give them false hope if something isn't as you've said it is. There's so many other issues I could have talked about today, but I'm sure you can appreciate that legal and financial aspects of dementia care is a massive topic to talk about in such a short time. I hope that I've covered enough that you have understood and learned and taken something away. Um, the biggest message from this discussion today is about considering the person you are dealing with, you are in a situation with. Think about their feelings, don't leave them guessing, give them, be as transparent as you can and give them as much detailed information as they need. Thank you all for listening today. If anyone has any questions, I will be around. Thank you.